I've chosen to read to you a mystery short story by the internationally best-selling Canadian author Kenneth Weber from his book, The Best of Five Minute Mysteries. Now, before I begin, Kenneth Weber says that here's an opportunity to use your powers of observation and deduction, to apply your detective skills, and test how well you can sift through the facts. The mystery short story is called A Clever Solution at the County Fair. Now, I'd like you to know that at the end of the story, the author poses a question, which I will actually tell you right now. Chris knows what Glint told Pincher to do, even though Ellie interrupted at the time, and now he's going to photograph it for his paper. What has Glint told Pincher to do? So as you may know, that your active listening and active involvement is essential for us to finish and solve the detective mystery together. So listen closely and sit back and relax. I hope you enjoy. It took only a couple of seconds for Chris Folligan to realize that the change in his luck was holding. On the other side of the gently flapping canvas wall, the executive director of the Quail County Fair Board was shouting into the telephone. Chris could hear it as plainly as if J. Luden Glint was talking to him directly. Who is this? Pincher? I thought so. Are you right there at the exhibit? Glint was getting louder. The answer must have been affirmative, for the next question was, well, can they hear you? Stipple and Two Feathers, I mean. Are they right there beside you, or? There was the briefest of pauses, and then a groan. Well, get private, for heaven's sakes. Glint was shouting now. Why do you think we give you people cell phones? Honestly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Never mind that now. Look. Check your watch. Call me back in exactly one minute, on the inside line. There was a slight thump, and then a loud honk, as J. Luden Glint cleared his nasal tracks before shouting once more, Ellie, bring me the entry forms on that homing pigeon exhibit, right away. Ellie, who was also on the other side of the canvas wall, must have hesitated or looked perplexed, because Glint came back immediately with, Yes, all of them. There's only half a dozen entries in that class. I was down there this morning before the judging. Do I have to do everything myself? Glint honked again. Twice. Chris was sympathetic, for he too had a cold, and wondered if that was what made the fair's executive director so cranky. Earlier that morning, Chris Folligan had given serious thought to using his cold as an excuse to skip the county fair and stay in bed. His assignment was, all things considered, hardly the cutting edge of journalism. Chris was a crime reporter. Well, more accurately, that's what he wanted to be. But when one worked for the Quail County Gleaner, crime was limited to the police report on the second page, and most of that dealt with nothing more dramatic than stolen sheep. What would make the front page of the Gleaner tomorrow? And the day after, and the day after that, was news about the county fair. That more than anything else had gotten Chris out of bed. Better to have a byline on the front page than no byline at all. Still, he'd spent the morning muttering under his breath about bad luck. Rain had begun to fall as soon as he entered the fairgrounds. Bad for his cold and even worse for his shoes. Now, there was not only cow patties to watch out for, but mud too, and the rain had thinned the crowd, reducing the opportunity for a story. Even on the gleaner, you had to have an angle to get onto the front page. But then the rain had brought good luck. A sudden downpour 
had driven Chris into the swine and fowl tent. He'd been walking past it, having decided well in advance to pretend it wasn't even there. And the first person he spotted was Madonna Two Feathers. She was always good for news. Madonna Two Feathers was an advocate for Native American rights and known well beyond the borders of Quail County for her less than discreet methods. If Madonna Two Feathers was here, Chris knew there had to be a story somewhere. Even if it was only a picture of her with her beloved pigeons, that in fact was something he did immediately. Photograph Madonna Two Feathers sitting in her wheelchair, holding a pair of pigeons in a cage on her lap. He then took a close-up of the identifying tag on the cage. Cream Rollers, it said, obviously referring to the breed. Underneath the tag, a blue rosette with a pair of trailing blue ribbons proclaimed first prize. Chris Folligan had been working in Quail County long enough to be aware that this was not some simple pet raising venture. Madonna Two Feathers and her family were internationally famous among pigeon fanciers. A prize winning pair of cream rollers could fetch thousands from the right buyer. That knowledge had made Chris hang around after the pictures were taken to peer at some of the other cream rollers. After all, the rain was still coming down. And there were five other pairs of pigeons in the exhibit. To Chris, however, they all looked exactly the same, making him wonder how the judges went about making a decision. Despite himself, he had leaned closer to the line of metal cages, and it was then that he found a story. The exhibitor right beside Madonna Two Feathers was Maxwell Stipple. Stipple was almost as well known as his neighboring exhibitor, but not for the kind of news the gleaner liked to print. Stipple was a self-proclaimed white supremacist who only three weeks before had paid a huge fine for distributing anti-Native American slogans in front of the courthouse. For Chris, this opportunity was a golden one. Even the gleaner would like his angle. Pigeons as the great leveler, the reason to set aside ill will and racist ideas in the clean spirit of competition. He'd immediately finished a roll of film on the spot and then forgetting entirely about the rain, dashed off to find Madonna Two Feathers again, a stipple too if he could, that had been an hour ago. In his excitement, he'd almost forgotten his editor's principal instruction to photograph and interview the 4-H Grand Champion. A feature for that was already half written for today's edition. With that obligation to see to, he'd lost track of both stipple and Two Feathers. And as a last resort, he had decided to turn to J. Luden Glint, who, if he was certain to be part of the story, would be sure to help. The sound of Glint's telephone brought Chris back to the present. Pincher. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, my God. What next? Glint wasn't shouting anymore, but he could still be heard very easily. An office in a tent just didn't make for privacy. Well, who spoke to you first? Stipple or Two Feathers? Yeah? Yeah, and Stipple says they're his cream rollers, and she says they're hers. Yeah, I know, they all look the same to me too. And he's claiming that the first prize ribbon was for his birds, and she switched the name tags, or maybe the ribbons. Oh, great. I, I think... Just a minute. Glint stopped to put out a tremendous honk. Now look, I can't leave here right now. Hey, there's no press there, is there? Good. Now here's what you do. Here's the solution. What you do is take the... Sir? Sir? It was Ellie, her large nose pushing right into Chris's face. 
You can't be here, sir. This is a restricted area. It's for employees of the fair board only. Now, if you need shelter from the rain, we're more than happy to. Chris didn't stick around for the rest of it. It would take at least five minutes to get across the fairgrounds to the exhibit where Pincher was about to follow Glint's instructions. And Chris wanted to get some shots of it. Now again, I'm going to tell you the question that the author poses. Chris knows what Glint told Pincher to do, even though Ellie interrupted at the time, and he's going to photograph it for his paper. What has Glint told Pincher to do? Please put your answer down in the comment section below so we can solve this detective story together. And be sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to comment. See ya.